Okay, this sermon's entitled, Modern So-Called Bibles Are Not the Word of God. I'd like to open up with prayer, and then with a few verses. All right, dear God, thank you for giving us your clear word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says. Bless the listeners, I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let's take a look at a verse that talks about... Let me open up with a few verses here. Proverbs chapter 30. And let's start off with verse 4. It reads... Who hath ascended up into heaven, or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name, and what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? Now look at verses 5 and 6 very carefully. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Now, the modern translations out there have verses missing, they have omissions, they have fractions of verses missing, they have words missing, like the the word blood, the word hell's missing, they have just the verses that are just completely, you know, ambiguous, they don't, they're not even clear at all. Like, for instance, if you turn to 1 John chapter 5, where we see in the King James Bible a verse on the Trinity, let's go ahead and turn there, 1 John chapter 5. This verse is an ambiguity in the, in the modern translations because it doesn't even make any sense. Okay, First John chapter five. In verse, verse verses six and seven, it talks about you know this is He that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. It is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. Now, if you were to read that out of the NIV, here's what it's going to read. Actually, let me read verse 7 in the King James. It says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now, let me read verse 7 out of the NIV. This doesn't even make sense. The NIV reads, For there are three that testify. That doesn't even make any sense. Testify of what? So these modern translations are demonic. They're farcical. They're a hoax. They're fraudulent. They're apocryphal. They're just completely bogus. And the devil's behind them, and anyone who holds up a stupid NIV and says, it the, and says that it's the word of God is wicked as hell. And these people that use these translations need to quit using them. They're not, it's not God's word. Okay? God's word has to be the entire canon. It can, you can't have verses missing. Now, let's take a look at a couple verses that make this clear. Turn to Luke chapter 4. I do believe in the, you know plenary verbal inspiration, the majority text. I believe that every word of God has to be there. So that goes. That tells you right away that these modern translations with verses missing, and let me give, let me give you a list of verses missing from the modern translations. Matthew 17, 21 is missing. Um, we're going to look at that one in a minute here. Matthew 18, 11, Matthew 23, 14, Mark 7, 16, Mark 9, 44, and 46. Look at Luke chapter 4, verse 4 says, And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And that tells us we have to have every word of God. Now turn over to Mark chapter 17, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 17, rather. Now this verse is taken out of the NIV and the other translations. Uh, verse 21, it says, in the verse preceding it, it talks about having the faith of a gra- the, the size of a grain of a mustard seed. And then it talks about, Nothing shall be impossible unto you, howbeit this kind goeth not out but, but by prayer and fasting. Now, why would you have a verse like this taken, taken out, omitted? It doesn't make any sense. And of course, if you jump over to the next chapter, Matthew 18.11 says, For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. And that whole verse is taken out. It just goes from 10 to 12. It's ridiculous. Okay, this is, this is a, just totally blasphemous. It's totally wicked to, to have these other translations and to sit there and call them the Word of God. I remember this one guy, this unsaved idiot who thinks you can lose your salvation. He held up the NIV one time and started crying. I'm like, you need to sit down and shut up and you need to throw that stupid piece of garbage in the trash where it belongs and start reading out of the King James and get saved, by, by the way, too, believing that you can lose your salvation and all this garbage. So it's, it's wicked. And that's why people that are not saved, wicked people are going to go for these modern translations because... It's not the word of God. So let's turn over to Luke chapter 24. Let me give you one more example why this is wrong. Luke chapter 24. It says in verse 25, we'll stop at verse 27. It says, And he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets he expounded, 
unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, it says, and this is a reference to Deuteronomy chapter 18. We're going to turn there, but where, where it actually gives you a prophetic verse. But it says you have to have all scriptures. You, okay, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures. If there are scriptures missing, how is this even possible? Okay, turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18, let's go to that verse, and look at verse 15, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. Now, this is talking about Christ, okay? And he's basically referencing verses in the New Testament, like John 1.45 and Acts 3.22, and he's saying that you're going to have to listen to these New Testament verses as well. They're going to be references to who Christ is. Now, obviously, you have to have the whole Bible. You have to have every word of God, or you, or you can't know everything about, about God or about Christ. Now, why would you trust a Bible that has words taken out, like the blood? Why would you, why would you trust a Bible that, that says nothing about the Trinity and just talks about you know, testifying? It doesn't make any sense. And then you have entire verses taken out. I mean, I don't see how anyone who takes the Bible seriously, would, would read one of these false Bibles and actually say it's the Word of God. It's wicked. And, and which one are we going to go by? You've got the NIV, you've got the RSV, you've got the, N, you know, the New American Standard, the NAS, you've got the Message, you've got the Voice, you've got the Everyday Bible, you've got the New King James, you've got the New New King James or whatever. You know, I don't know, but my point is, what do we go by? Which one of these translations, or should I say stupid false translations, do we go by? Okay, I'm going by the King James Bible because that is the standard. I mean, this, we didn't have a bunch of translations back, back when this came out. Okay? And people say, well, there's different manuscripts. No, I don't really care. Okay? God can preserve his word in the, Engl in the English language, and he has done so by the King James Bible. And I'm just so sick of people you know, just disregarding this because they think it's hard or they think it's, you know, taxing or, you know... I don't know what they think, but it's not. It's not <clears throat> It's not hard to understand. It's easy. It's simple. So these modern translations are not an equivalent. They're not some type of just an alternative. They're wicked. They're of the devil. They're demonic. And we should not be using them because they are not the word of God. You know, John 3.16 is, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's not, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. Okay? It's, that's, not what, that's not what it says. Okay? We need to stick with the Word of God and stop changing it and adding to it and subtracting from it. And that's what these modern Bibles have done. They're wicked as the devil, and I'm calling them what they are right now. Wicked, and they're not the Word of God. So... We need to stop pretending like they are. That's all I have. Dear God, thank you for giving us your clear word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says. Bless the listeners. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Let me find. Oh, I got another dime. Okay, this sermon's entitled, Hard Preaching is the Only Preaching. I'd like to open up with prayer, and then with a few verses. All right, dear God, thank you for giving us your clear word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says. Bless the listeners, I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 61 reads, Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee, when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for thou hast been a shelter for me, and a strong tower from the enemy. Now, if you turn to Psalm 18 and look at verse 30, it tells us that there's only one way with God. There's only one way to preach. I've heard lots of people say, well, there are different nuances and different ways to preach. And, you know, sometimes you have to be soft and sometimes you have to kind of pick up the decibel level. Look, there's only one way with 18. It says, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is, is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. When it comes to preaching God's word, there's only one way to preach, and it's, it's hard preaching. Now, I'm going to prove that right now. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and look at verse 23. Now, the message is supposed to offend people, and a soft message is not going to offend anybody. Now, think about it. Imagine if a person goes to some stupid, watered-down, liberal, apostate, you know, charismatic, non-denominational church or whatever, and then it's just a bunch of, you know, 
milksopish, namby-pamby, mama's boy, wimpy preaching. <clears throat> now, that's not going to cause anyone to grow at all. And a person can go sit and, and be exposed to that junk for 10 years, and they'll totally stagnate in their, in their, in their spiritual walk. And they'll be a, a football you know, game watcher. They'll be a non-soul winner. They'll be a lazy bum. And then 10 years elapse, and they're still that way. Now, what does that tell you? That tells you that there's something wrong with the preaching. There's something wrong with the message. There's something wrong with the presentation. And it's just all, you know, in vain. But when it comes to hard, solid, you know, biblically sound, you know, stentorian, thunderous preaching, that has an effect on people. That will change people. We see this example right here of how the Word of God is either going to be a stumbling block or it's going to be foolishness. But it's going to offend, that's the point. Verse 23, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. Now, the message is a powerful message. It's about Jesus Christ, who's the Savior of the world, who was crucified for, for our sins. Now, that's not a message that needs to be preached lightly, or that needs to be taken, you know, <clears throat> dismissively, or looked at, basically, negligibly. This is a message that needs to be deemed as something very powerful, something very salient, something significant, and it's something that we do not need to take lightly and that we do not need to be preaching lightly. Okay? We don't need Mr. Rogers or Ben Stein, you know, preaching with God's word. We need somebody to get up there, you know, preach it the way it needs to be preached with a loud, solid voice, and they need to do it with boldness, or they don't need to be doing it at all. Now, let's turn over to Ephesians chapter 6. When it comes to eternal you know, life versus eternal damnation, heaven or hell, this message is not an unremarkable, just run-of-the-mill, take-it-or-leave-it message. But the devil would like to convince people that, you know, and that's what he has done. He's convinced a lot of people that Christianity does not mean anything, the Bible does not mean anything to certain people, doesn't, it's not important, it's just some old you know, religious book, and it's not going to have any effect on anybody, when the fact is the Bible is gonna deter, determines where everyone's going. You know, believers on Christ go to heaven. Those who reject the gospel, those who do not believe on Christ and never believe on him, go to hell. And you think that if you want to th- sit there and pretend like that, this is not, you know, applicable to your life, and this, this has nothing to do with you, you're insane, you'll be in hell and you'll burn forever, and, and people need to, need to wake up. Okay, they want to walk around thinking the Bible has no significance in my life, it, it doesn't, it's not going to affect me at all wrong. It's going to affect everybody because everyone is a sinner, and there is a heaven and there is a hell, and that's why we need to you know, preach the gospel with boldness, because this is a serious message, and this message you know, is life or death. <clears throat> so let's turn over to Ephesians chapter 6, look at verses 19 and 20, it says, And for me the utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. The message has to be bold, otherwise it's not going to get the job done. Now, a lot of people don't agree with this. They think you can sit there and listen to some, you know, sorry little, you know, pastor grumble who gets behind the pulpit and just kind of whines through the scriptures, and they think that's, that's, that's okay, that, that'll suffice. No, it won't suffice. Now, let me prove that. It's got to be forcible. It's got to be bold, or it's not going to have any effect on anybody. Okay, turn over to turn back to Job chapter six. All this grumbling stuff is doing is just causing people to not change. Is all it's doing, you know? Stupid, sorry, carnal football watchers. They come in to listen to the message when they get it, when they when they go back home. Guess what? It's it's the football game all over again. Okay, it's pathetic. It's sorry, and that's exactly what soft preaching is engendering. No change. No, you know, it's engendering a bunch of lazy, do nothing. People full of lassitude. It's all, it's all it's doing. And it's a sad thing. Hard preaching gets the job done. Hard preaching has an effect on people. Job chapter 6 verse 25 says, How forcible are right words. But what doeth your arguing reprove? So he's saying right there, the correct words, preached correctly, have, a, have force. There's a driving force behind it. And that's why hard preaching will get people to change. It'll get people to wake up and uh, stop watching their stupid television and to start going soul winning. It does a lot of things. It gets people just to wake up. It causes them to grow because that's what God intended. And if you're going to preach about hell, you know, Revelation 20:15, talking about people being cast into the lake of fire, that's a severe message. Okay? 
eternal damnation is a severe message. You know, it's something that needs to be preached with boldness, as hard as we can preach it. All preaching should be hard, because number one, there's something important to be said, and if you're not going to say it with, with some force and some dent, you're not going to say it with some strength, then what's the point? What's the point of um, you know having a message that's going to be so suppressed that nobody can hear it, and nobody can get anything out of it, and it's not going to affect anybody? Okay, the Bible makes it very clear, a true witness delivereth souls, but a deceitful witness speaketh lies. So if you want to have a true witness that delivers souls, you're going to have to have a message that's going to be heard, and it's going to be understood, and it's going to be embraced. And you can't do that with soft, mellow, yellow preaching. You have to have hard, powerful, you know, bold preaching, otherwise you're just wasting your time, and it's, you're not helping anybody. So that's all I have. Hard preaching is what gets the job done. It, it's what changes people. It's what wakes people up. And people need to hear it. And we don't need to be exposed to all this, you know, this whiny garbage. And all that stuff does is waste people's time. And it, it, it gets them, basically, it gets them too over-acclimated to that stuff that when they hear the real deal, they don't know what to do with it. What you need to do is get acclimated or get accustomed to some you know, hard preaching, and then you're used to it, and then it becomes commonplace and then you know you'll just you'll hear it all the time and you'll appreciate it so that's all i have if it's not hard preaching it's not preaching at all before i close i'd like to give you an example of why it has to be hard now let's let's just pretend hypothetically that some false prophet came into town and you have pastor milksop or pastor milk toast and he's going to warn you about this false prophet in a very mild mannered you know way so he comes into the congregation and tells them there's this guy out there he's you know, he's a little bit off on his doctrine. And we should just agree to disagree. You know, live and let live. And we should pray for him. Now, that's the soft approach. Now, let's take a harder line with this. Okay, here's what I would do. I would say there's an unsaved false prophet devil over there who's teaching lordship salvation, who's going to drop into hell. He's not worth spitting on. And we need to ignore that false prophet. And we need to mark him and avoid him like the Bible says. You know, he's nothing but a stupid devil. Now, that type of preaching is going to have an effect. People are going to listen to that. They're going to take heed to, to the message, and it's going to it's going to give them kind of a, you know, a red flag, a sense of a, like you know, something like a you know code red. And there's something wrong with this guy. We need to we need to, we need to avoid him. So hard preaching gets the job done. This, you know, this pacifistic, soft, you know, diplomatic preaching doesn't do anything. So we need to warn people, and we need to do it the way the Bible does it, and by calling them by name. And that's, so that's all I have. Dear God, thank you for giving us your clear word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says. Bless the listeners, I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. What does the sign say? It says, Jesus Christ said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believes on me has everlasting life. Once you believe on Jesus Christ, you have everlasting life. You're saved forever. Cool. Give me five. Okay, this sermon's entitled, Right Division. Right Division. I'd like to open up with prayer, and then with a few verses. All right, dear God, thank you for giving us your clear word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says. Bless the listeners, I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let's open up with Proverbs chapter 12. Whoso loveth instruction loveth knowledge. But he that hateth reproof is brutish. A good man obtaineth favor of the Lord, but a man of wicked devices will he condemn. A man shall not be established by wickedness, but the root of the righteous shall not be moved. Now, let's turn back to Deuteronomy. All throughout the Bible we see examples of people being exhorted or encouraged or, you know, basically commanded, so to speak, to get into the Word of God and to study it out. The Bible is very clear that it has to be studied. It's the Bible is good just to just to read, and, but it's also there are parts of it that you need to study study it out. You need to basically analyze the text. We call this you know ex exegesis, and we need to basically understand what the Bible is talking about. You know, and who's it you know written to? <clears throat> See, not every passage in the Bible is written to the lost. The lost we have the book for the lost we have the book of John, where it tells you at the very end. Well, these are written that you might believe, and that you know believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. 
And we have John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now those verses are for the lost people so that they can be saved by the grace of God if they believe on Christ. And there are also, there are also verses in the Bible for the saved. Like if you, re if you read through the Pauline epistles, a lot of these verses are for are believers. In fact, all of them are for believers. And, they're exhort and most of them are exhortations to live a certain way because they're already saved. So you, if, you, if you don't rightly divide the word of God, you're going to get everything wrong and you're going to cause confusion and you're going to get the gospel wrong too. So that's why we are exhorted to study the scripture. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 31. Look at verse 12. Gather the people together, men and women, and children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear and that they may learn and fear the Lord your God and observe to do all the words of this law. Now what this is saying is that it's not just for the, the pastor or the preacher to learn. It's for everybody, men and women and children. So believe it or not, anybody can learn God's word. Because if you're saved, you have the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit teaching you God's word, and therefore he's the perfect teacher. So we are basically, like, like this says, we are instructed to learn God's word, and we have to rightly divide it. So let's, t let's take a look at the next verse. And that their children, which have not known anything, may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as ye live in the land, whither ye go over Jordan to possess it. So we're called to learn the scriptures. Let's turn over to Acts chapter 17. And I'm just telling you, you have to rightly divide. You have to say, who is this written to? What does this mean? You have to use the clear verses. That they have to take precedence over the obscure verses. You, you take what's clear and say, this is what the Bible says. This is a clear, you know, biblical statement. And these obscure verses, or they're not so clear, those verses have to be interpreted in light of the clear. You can't take the obscure and say, okay, let's, let's establish a doctrine or let's establish a theology with this verse and then ignore all these clear passages like John 3.16 or Acts 16.31 or verses you know, that talk about salvation being by faith, faith alone. You can't, you've got to take the clear verses and, and say, okay, we know, what these, we know what these verses are saying. Now we have to rightly divide the rest of the, the scripture in light of the clear. So this is called the analogy of faith. So turn to Acts chapter 17, and basically people that study the Bible study it you know, without some type of a preconceived idea, or without some type of, of a theological bent, or a theological bias, or some type of a weird understanding of scripture. You have to study it out with an open mind and be open-ended and realize that, hey, God's going to have to teach you his word and you're going to have to just you know, take, it, take it at face value and, and not try to read something into the text. That You can't do that. So it says in, in verse 11, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. And it says, Therefore many of them believed also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. Now, what this is saying is that these people searched the scriptures daily, okay? They didn't just, well, basically, oh, I read the Bible when I was like a, you know, in, in the military or in jail or something, and, and that's it. No, you need to read it daily. You need to get into the Word every single day, and then, you'll, then God will teach you. And that's why you have to receive it with readiness of mind, not with some preconceived idea, the preconceived ideas come from tradition, and they, they will make it, they'll, they'll stultify your ability to understand what God's clear word is, is, is saying, and you'll miss it completely. People that believe you can lose your salvation and all this weird work salvation garbage, they miss the point of all these verses. You know, they miss, they miss the, the, the plain verses in the scripture that just tell you, you know, it's eternal life. It's, ever, it's everlasting. They miss all that too. And it doesn't make any sense. And that's why if you, if you just read the Bible without any, without any direction, or without any um, you know, you know, knowledge of how to rightly divide, you're going you're gonna to fail every time in understanding what it says. So let's turn over to the famous, the famous verse on this, 2 Timothy, chapter number 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. This is very important. It says, study, verse, verse 15, Study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So what this is saying is that it, we're going to have to take time and study the Bible. It's not a matter of just reading it. You have to study it. 
You know, you have to you have to take a, a, every passage you look at and say, okay, who's it talking to? Is it talking to a believer? Is it talking to an unbeliever? If it's if it's you know, chances are it's talking to a believer. If it's something Paul wrote, and that's why we're exhorted to study the Bible. We're exhorted to understand it. People come up with all sorts of weird the- theologies when they don't rightly divide, and they get everything wrong, and it's just a sad thing. So we need to understand, you know, clear verses come take precedence over the obscure. And what that means is that we go by what the clear verse says, and that's a and that's an, uh, you know a fact, you know that whatever it says, like John three sixteen is a fact, and then then if you have a verse that seems to contradict that, you know that there are no contradictions in the scripture because God is not duplicitous. Therefore, there can't, there can't be a contradiction. So if you see an apparent contradiction, you have to realize that it's not really a contradiction. You need to study it out and figure out what it really means or what it's really trying to say. You know, like we have the difference between Paul and James. Paul is saying faith alone. James is saying faith plus works. Well, we know it can't be faith plus works. So, and, we, and we know that, so we have to figure out what this is talking about. We have to rightly divide. And if you study it out, you realize that there's no contradiction there at all. Paul is teaching faith alone. James is too. The thing is, he's just talking about, you know, he's, he's, he's addressing an issue of, 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 of having no works. And, and he's not even talking about being saved there. He's just talking about, you know, being an active, an active Christian. It's nothing to do with salvation. So we have to rightly divide. You can't wrongly divide. You can't just sit there and, and isolate certain passages and say, all right, this, this, is, this is what the Bible says, and then just ignore hundreds of verses that, that say something totally you know, antithetical to that. You have to sit there and, and, and fuse it all together, and you have to come up with you know, a finalized answer that does not contradict. So there's no contradiction between you know, James and Paul. It's just you have to understand you know, what it means and harmonize it. Okay, so if people would rightly divide, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have all these problems. And like I said, the analogy of faith is whatever the Bible says in making a clear statement or a clear assertion, you go by that as the rule of, okay, hundreds of verses say this, or maybe five or ten verses say this, or a couple dozen verses say this. You can't take one, one or two obscure passages and, and go by that and, that, and then let that be, you know, the basically the example that you're going to, that you're going to, you know, you know, your, your example for interpreting the scripture, you have to go by the clear verses, and then you, then you figure out what the obscure, or what the nebulous, or what the, you know, taxing verses actually mean, but you have to do it in light of the, of the clear. An example would be, you have a passage that seems to contradict eternal security. Well, you know that can't be, because, you know, eternal security is taught all the way through the Bible. You know, it's taught in John, it's taught in Romans, it's taught everywhere. So, whatever this rare, or not so clear verses saying you cannot make it contradict what the Bible clearly teaches in dozens of verses. You have to rightly divide and say, okay, this must mean something else. This must be a, an issue of sanctification, or it must be an issue of you know rewards in heaven or lo- or the loss thereof. So it can't be. You can't have two you know conflicting teachings. It doesn't work that way. You can't pit scripture against scripture. You, you, it doesn't fly because the Bible says it's all profitable for doctrine. And that's why we have to rightly divide, instead of just picking up the Bible at, at random and opening it up anywhere, and then just arbitrarily, you know, reading any passage, you know, um, with no no context or no understanding of what the actual passage is talking about. That's why we don't need to just um, just pick up the Bible with alacrity and just say, okay, let's just jump into it here, and, and then and this is what. No, we need to rightly divide. We need to understand who you know who it's written to. What it's talking about, we need to you know study it out and, need, and pray about it, and then God will 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 reveal what, it, what what the Bible is saying to us. But if we don't rightly divide, then we come up with all sorts of theological problems, and we come up with all different sorts of you know contradictions and stuff, and it's just not it's not what God intended. So right division is very important. That's all I have. Dear God, thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says. Bless the listeners. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. the gospel message in a nutshell the bible says we're all sinners everyone is a sinner we cannot save ourselves we can't go to heaven on our own but god who loved the world sent his only begotten son jesus christ to die on the cross for our sins he was buried in the tomb and then on the third day he rose again 
Jesus Christ gives eternal life as a free gift to anyone who simply believes on him for it. He says in John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. So he saves us from hell and gives us the gift of eternal life that can never be lost. Once a person is saved, they're always saved. It's called eternal security. Jesus said, whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. So once you're saved, you're going to heaven no matter what. And John 3.16 makes this whole thing very clear. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that's Jesus, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish in hell, but have everlasting life in heaven. John 3.16 promises us we're going to heaven the moment a person believes on Christ. It's that simple. Thank you, and we are off.